This video from the Communication Trust and Aphasic has been developed to support anyone working with children and young people with how to raise initial concerns about a child or young person's speech, language and communication development with their parents. Throughout this video, we'll use the term parent to refer to parents, carers and other family members who may be the primary carer of a child or a young person. Partnership working with those who know the child or young person best can have a huge impact on progress and development. Every child and every family is different, so this isn't intended as a prescriptive, one-size-fits-all approach, but rather an overview of key principles to consider when having conversations with parents. This video is intended to be used as a professional development resource to enhance confidence and skills in talking with parents about their child's speech, language and communication development and skills, with reflection and discussion points throughout. Both policy and evidence tell us that involving parents is best for the child or young person. Practitioners working with children and young people have a responsibility to identify where they notice that speech, language and communication skills are not developing as expected for their age and parents should be central to the identification and assessment process. Early identification of speech, language and communication needs is crucial whatever age the young person or child and it's essential that you feel confident in raising your concerns. There are three main sections within this video. Preparation, during the conversation, and next steps. After each section, there is a prompt for reflection or discussion if you're watching the video as a group. We would encourage all practitioners working with children and young people to have regular discussions with parents about their child's speech, language and communication development, providing observations and examples promoting the home learning environment and helping parents to understand the importance of speech, language and communication as a central life skill. Research based on discussions with parents of children with speech, language and communication needs indicates that parents do view communication as a skill which underpins many other areas of development. Therefore it should be embedded in discussions about a child's progress. Where the discussion around speech, language and communication is used as a basis on which to raise concerns with a parent, you'll need to be prepared and plan for the conversation. Your meeting can be as informal or as formal as you wish to make it, and the preparation time needed will depend on a number of factors, such as how well you know the child and their parents, how much you have discussed their speech, language and communication development more generally, and the complexity of the child's speech, language and communication needs. be informal first of all because I'd like to I don't want them to panic so it'd just be like a little oh could we have just a little chat that kind of thing and then just briefly explain what maybe my concerns or observations were and um, obviously also reassuring the parent not to worry and then just making a time that would be suitable to the parent where we could actually sit down and have a more of a full-on conversation about it. I think in my experience that was the best way because they knew us anyway after setting their child into the reception class so we had that relationship and I think doing it informally was a better approach and they really were on board with it all. 
also it would depend on how well we have, I have the relationship with the parent as well at first. It depends on like, how well we know each other um, and the time that we've spent together. Well, I'd want the teacher to feel comfortable to say it to me because I would want to know, I'm his mum, I would want to know if they had any concerns because I might have them concerns myself. It would probably be around about six months. She was not babbling. She wasn't doing the things that her brother used to do, you know, did as a baby. So I suppose when you're a second time mum, you kind of pick up on these things a lot quicker. But it's just taking like baby steps, being very, very gentle with the parent, just building up that relationship a bit more as well. So then they feel a bit more comfortable and not just feel like you're some stranger that may be imposing your views. And I mean, a family that I was working with um, had been very transient and there had been um, past incidences of domestic violence and things that will have undoubtedly impacted on that child and, and his experiences. Um, and so when I was having this conversation with mum, she was then able to open up and say, well, yeah, you know what's happened before and I'm worried that this might be the reason why he's struggling with his speech or you know, why he gets frustrated or why he does X, Y and Z. Um, so kind of having that context is, help, is often quite helpful and it can also be um, a good way to kind of lead into the conversation. So when, when mum or whoever's telling me about the previous history or the things that have happened to them as a family or their current circumstances, um, as part of that conversation you'll often say, well, what, what do you think the children have made of that? How, you know, do you think they've been affected in any way? Is there anything you're worried about as a result? And so speech and language is one of those things. It often comes up in the context of having a conversation like that. The evidence we used is a screening from our speech and language therapist, we use that and we also use it through observations, how they are in class, how they are in their learning sessions, if they're a bit fidgety or if we can hear something of their language or if they're communicating not as well as they should be, we use that as our evidence mainly. It's really good to see his actual books and to see photos of him playing with the other kids and things like that, it's really helpful. It tends to be um, anecdotal information from teachers mm -hmm. and then also I, by that stage if we're going to think about using outside agencies then I've been in and um, done an observation as well and looked at books so that's the kind of evidence that we tend to use, um, observations and books and, and from several different people rather than just one person because obviously one, a parent might say well um, the teacher doesn't really might say the teacher doesn't really get my son or get my daughter so it's about um having quite a few people with opinions that you know and also just talking gently through um you know difficulties and also making it really clear that this is very supportive and that um speech and language difficulties can sometimes have an impact on uh, literacy acquisition so and that usually really makes parents really because speech and language can seem a bit wishy-washy to some parents, you know, with its attention and it's, you know, receptive and expressive. And I think it's, when you say it'll have an impact on literacy, I think parents really do take notice then. It's best to try and help them as young as you can, really, so when they're older they can be fluent. Hopefully this conversation is not the first time that you've spoken to parents about their child's speech, language and communication development. But even so, it can be difficult to get the conversation started. It's essential that this is a two-way conversation. Use questions to bring parents into the conversation and make sure they understand that their opinion, as the person who knows the child best, is all part of building the picture. Um, asking them their, their thoughts about, about how their child communicates with them and um, whether there's anything that they're worried about or whether, there's, or whether they're not worried. You know, Sometimes it might be that I have observed something and they haven't observed it or they're not concerned about it um, and it's just about having a two-way 
conversation to let them kind of tell me what their observations and experiences are. Um, yeah, and then you kind of explore a bit more from there. I, I like to do it in a really exploratory way, not in a this is what I'm seeing, what do you think about it type thing, but more, oh, is it is he always like this? Or is it sometimes? Or, you know, have you noticed a difference on this? You know, um, more more in that way I find it, it works and parents don't, don't seem to respond negatively to that. They seem to welcome having a conversation about it so that um, they can say how they feel. But also, they're often interested in what you're saying as a professional, I find, um, because they know that you see lots and lots and lots and lots of children on a day-to-day -day basis. So, Especially if it's a parent of an only child and they have no comparisons to draw or, you know, that kind of thing. It's also about the relationship with the teacher. I think that's the thing, that's the key, is relationships, because I think a lot of our parents are quite wary of people, um, especially, I think, people they perceive to be in authority. So it's all about relationships and breaking down those barriers and being um, really unjudgment, non-judgmental and, and friendly and approachable, and that takes time. Um, so, for example, I've, I accompanied a family out into the community and the little boy was talking to me while we were on the bus and the vast majority of what he was saying I found really difficult to understand. So um, I was sort of then turning to mum and saying, oh, do, do, do you know what he was just saying? Or trying to encourage him to repeat it and that kind of thing. Um, and then just saying to her, oh, how, do, how do you find him to understand? And she would say, um, yeah, it's really difficult or, you know, sometimes I don't know what he's saying or sometimes he'll get frustrated. And so that then is a good opener to kind of have a bit more of a conversation and explore. Is it in certain situations? Is it when he's nervous? Is it when he's upset? Is it, you know, how do you feel about it? You know, what is it like in comparison to your other little boy? That, you know. So just having a, a less formal conversation. It's nice because it could just be brought in while we're out and about together, really. So. I would show them the screening and I would say, oh, hi, by the way, we've just been screening such and such on for speech and language. And this is what we found. Is it OK if we involve them in our groups? Are you OK with that? How do you feel? Do you think there's a need? How do you think he's communicating? How do you think he's setting into school? How do you think his confidence is? We talk about all those things that he will need, all those skills that he will need in school to develop. And then I hear their perspective and then we put it into practice as best we can. The nursery were really uh, were really good in terms of um, showing us um, where he should be um, in terms of his um, the, the scorings they do in terms of where he should be alongside his peers and how he, he wasn't alongside his peers. So they were very good at highlighting that to us. And I think you know we we were helped in that people recognised Sam has pro had problems. I think as a parent, one thing we felt very strongly was that, that at a certain stage and um, until we got to Meath, we felt that we weren't being listened to. We were told that um, other people knew better. And I think there is occasionally this hesitation to believe a parent in that perhaps you think they're in denial or they feel strongly for more emotional reasons rather than um, and, uh, having a subjective, uh, sorry, an objective opinion about it. But actually, we really could tell he understood us, but particularly because he um, it, it was in context um, with his family. And we could see that he had a level of understanding that he wasn't able to replicate in tests. And I, I think um, to be, parents need to feel listened to anyway, but when they are strongly saying, we think this, I think that shouldn't be dismissed. And that's one of the problems we had. The majority of conversations I've had with parents about these kinds of things, they appear to either be interested or on board or already have those concerns and are grateful that somebody has kind of um, reassured them that, you know, yes there, is a, yes, there is possibly something that your child might need some support with and this is where we can go to get it. Yeah, I would have really appreciated the nursery, health visitor, to GP even when I've gone there over the years to be like, we understand your concern, this is a long battle with Stephen's problems, let's try and get some sort of support or help in for him specifically, but there was nobody, nobody would take any of it seriously until he was at Meath. So yeah, he had no one. And also honesty, you know, we work with a lot of speech and language therapists um, and teachers and nursery staff and over, over you know, his, his early years, 
Perhaps someone should have said, honestly, we think there's a deeper problem going on here. Um, so we felt really lucky how, um, how well supported we were at the beginning, especially when you first have an initial diagnosis and it's so hurtful and so worrying that they were so supportive um, with, with that. And, and we felt they really cared. And that helped hugely to feel that they feel your child who isn't at the same level as others that they would be, um, they matter just as much. Their progress, however small it may be, it matters just as much as a mainstream child. That felt really, really good. Um, and that's the thing, if your child can speak well or for the direction, I think you think they're doing well maybe with the speech and language, so maybe it would be better for them to actually go into detail about it, because I didn't know everything about it really, and it would be nice for me to know so I could teach my child. So that's what I explained to them and they sort of, oh I see, So because they talk all the time at home, they never shut up and you think, yeah, I can understand that, but this is what we want them to do at school in our learning environment, this is our expectation, so to speak, and then you get the different perspective. And then they are more likely to say, well actually I did note this or I wasn't quite sure and you know, so um, it's just good to share our knowledge as practitioners with the parents as well. Um, so that the parents feel more comfortable in perhaps approaching us as well about any issue or concern that they may have with their child's speech and language. So maybe if a parent and a teacher has a more in-depth conversation, they'll know what's best to do when it comes to the child. Um, we do make it easier for um, parents, you know, if you know, they, they don't have English as an additional language, or they have English as an additional language, so then we'll, um, you know, uh, We've got lots of people in the staff in the school who do actually speak different languages, so it's great. You know, so we, we have interpreters um, sort of in the school ready, so it's great. And that kind of makes them feel more at home in terms of speaking their own language, so yeah. There has been discrepancy sometimes between my perception of how things are going for that child and a parent's. So I actually recently accompanied a parent to a speech and language um, kind of assessment yeah. and mum reported her child to be speaking a lot more than I had observed. Um, so I don't know if it was maybe difficult for her to acknowledge the, the, level, of, you know, the level of difficulty that her, her child was having. We have, I have had in my experience one or two parents that have been challenging and there's like, um, what do you mean that I don't think there's a concern? And also I think the type of difficulties with speech and language, um, parents perceive them as being um, cognitive things rather than um, behaviour. Sometimes there are behaviour links, but I think you have more difficult discussions with parents when it's around behaviour, and I know there can be a link with speech and language and behaviour. Because I think some parents don't see that there is a need there and they think their child is okay and it is, they are in denial and they don't see how they, they need these skills to help them with their learning in the classroom. They don't see what skills are really needed, like the sitting and the listening and the focusing. They just see speech and language and they don't see what goes, it all involves. It's very important to keep your conversation with parents solution focused. Be prepared to develop some action points with the parent to start the journey of support through the assess, plan, do, review cycle, involving parents every step of the way. Deciding on action points should be done in partnership with parents where possible.
parent has to feel comfortable with the goals that we're setting because we don't want to set something that is unrealistic for the parent or they may feel like you know it's um it's quite tough for them to achieve yeah sometimes i'll do it through the pack that i'll send home and also look at their targets for their maths target or their literacy target and i'll try and incorporate it through that way so the pack is all evolved around their their learning within the classroom so it will be all linked up so i would be asking the parent what they what they would like to do, especially if they, they are the ones that have flagged it up to me and said, actually, I'm a little bit worried he doesn't say enough or sometimes I can't understand him. Or, and I might say to them, well, what, what would you like to do about that? And they might say, well, I don't really know what I can do about that. And then I might present several options. So I might say, well, we could go along to a chatter time session or um, I could actually make a referral for you or we can you know, um, speak to the childcare worker or maybe try and do some exercises with him in as part of a stay and play, just kind of informally, especially if, if it was a child who seemed quite nervous about talking or, you know. Um, I would really take my cue from the parent, but I would, I would be kind of trying to encourage them to seek some kind of support. Once we've started initially, I'll get a little pack together and I will send it home with the parent to work with that child at home and they can bring it into school as well to show their progress and then I will work with the parents in that way. Through my knowledge as well of the training of speech and language, I will able to, I'll be able to, depending on their age of the child as well, give them some tips that they could do at home. That could be uh, little activity sheets or even stuff like visual cues and visual timetables that they could do at home. We could even make them in our centre together as well. So they could be little things that the parents can do at home and just how to just simplify things so it's not really a big scary thing for them, just stuff that they can in incorporate into their lifestyle at home. In order for it to feel collaborative, I would be careful about giving advice. Often if they're asking, well, what do you think or what can I try? Um, I might say, oh, have you tried? Or, you know, what do you think about so-and-so? Um, so yeah, I might be encouraging them to, to try different things with their child at home, you know, um, talking to them a bit more, describing activities, doing things at home that encourage them to talk, that kind of thing. If a parent um, does feel any concerns or would like some more information, say perhaps that I'm not able to give, then I will refer them to drop-in sessions that are specifically for speech and language. And also um, there's a good Evelina link online that also is for parents and practitioners and it gives you tips of the week, what you can do at home and kind of stuff like that. So I would di then direct them to them resources as well. But we almost always do referrals for pretty much any difficulty because there's often, in, especially in our school, a speech and language link um, and it screens things in or screens things out. It might have to go further. If there's a significant need, they might be ha have to be transferred to other agencies like speech and language therapists outside of school or in-house as well because a speech and language therapist work in school with us so they might have to have sessions with them and that is how we refer them. Look, it might be as simple as them giving you some strategies to help you with your child or it might be that they need specific, you know, tailored support with their speech and language. In my experience, all the teachers have said, well, what you're doing, look at the difference. They can see them, the difference in their learning, in their sitting, in their concentration, and that's just wonderful and the rewards are just great. <laughs> I think that some of the most helpful things practitioners can do is um, direct you to particular charities, blogs, websites and information because if you, you're able to research and find out things yourself, you're empowered to help your own child and I think that's, um, it, it's, it's very difficult to do that alone and that's the thing they can help most with. But I think we're all learning an awful lot more about how language can affect so many different areas of a child's development um, and their personality as well. This initial conversation is the beginning of being able to work with parents to ensure the best for their child and starts the assess, plan, do, review cycle of support. 
This initial conversation is just that, the initial step in working together to achieve the best for a child or young person. If you're interested in learning more about identifying and supporting children and young people's speech, language and communication development and working in partnership with parents, take a look at the Communication Trust website for more information. You can also find some useful information on Aphasic and ICANN's websites. We've developed a summary of some of the key points in this video to help you prepare for this conversation. It can be downloaded for free on our website. You can also complete a short survey to tell us what you think about this video.